So hey everyone, my name is Daniel Berwin. Um, I have a pretty interesting background. I've worked across uh, AAA games at EA and Activision. Um, I've worked on location-based experiences with Imagineering. Um, I've done uh, sort of how to expand t TV franchises into interactive at Lucasfilm. And for the past two years, I worked at Jaunt VR. Just out of curiosity, how many people have heard of Jaunt? Okay, a handful of you guys. And I think what's interesting is the overlap today is that this is sort of uh, a mobile-based company trying to bring the first version of VR into uh, you know, a mainstream way with 360 video. Um, I currently run a consulting operation called Adjacent Possible, and I also work as a creative director uh, with the Robot Sea Monster. Um, so today what I really want to talk about is sort of demographics for the industry. I think that there's a lot of um, a need for sort of bringing some order to the chaos of VR right now. And so I hope that the tools that I've learned from dealing with this at Jaunt um, over the past two years is helpful for you. So um, I like to break down sort of the demographics into three basic buckets. You have the avant-garde, early adopters, and mainstream. Uh, this spans both across creators, businesses, and, uh, and consumers as well. Uh, we're going to dig a little deeper into this, so don't worry if you can't read all of that. Um, so the way I like to think about it is that VR is like a train moving down the tracks and um, every week there's new changes and uh, basically the avant-garde is sort of leading the charge. They're the tip of the spear trying to figure out how to push the boundaries of the medium. Early adopters come next trying to figure out how to take the lessons of the avant-garde and pull, pull that into something meaningful for mainstream consumer audiences. And then at the very end you have mainstream businesses and mainstream consumers. And so basically knowledge at the front kind of trickles down over time uh, to the rest of the train. So. Let's dig into these, uh, these content creators. And I think, again, the reason why this is so interesting to me is because um, this is really, for 360 video, it's a mobile-based economy. It's a mobile-based ecosystem. And so a lot of the uh, trends you'll see, I think, with these creators also have, um, I think, a valid sort of amount of you know, overlap with that of mobile gaming. All right, so the avant-garde. So again, tip of the spear, uh, very experimental in terms of uh, who they are. <laughs> Interesting transition in there. I don't know where that came from. Um, so you know, they tend to be a little bit more flamboyant, a little bit more about uh, pushing the boundaries of, of art and technology. And um, you know, they show at uh, museums, art galleries, research labs, and academia, things like that. And um, I guess it's just going to do that for all the slides. Awesome. All right. So, uh, you know, they're happy to show up places where you have a highly curated crowd, and they don't really care about reaching a mainstream audience. They're really concerned about, I think, pushing the furthest boundaries of the medium and shaping culture. And so, Tribeca Film Festival, if anyone's been to that, seen the VR at Tribeca. Not so many people, not that surprising, I guess. Or Sundance. Uh, these are places where the avant-garde comes to showcase the latest and greatest stuff. And often the stuff that they make is um, very far away from uh, what mainstream consumers can actually access. Uh, they're kind of outside the box thinkers. They're really ahead of the curve with you know, the stuff that's going on in the space. Um, so again, you know, they don't really care about the stuff they make reaching a consumer audience. Um, they're not really about you know, trying to create something that you could actually buy in a storefront. Um, I'm just going really fast here because I know it's the end of the day. But basically, what I find so cool about the avant-garde is that the stuff you'll see that they do is like just miles ahead of anything else that you would you ever see in a consumer offering. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of Hunger in LA. It was the first um, VR experience to come to Sundance, and it was a Six Degrees of Freedom experience, and it came out in 2012. And so this is long before the Oculus is on the market. In fact, the technology that was built on was the predecessor to the Oculus Rift. So right out the gate, the first experience uh, for you know, VR consumption in the avant-garde space was a Six Degrees of Freedom experience. Um, this is Tree down below. Uh, tree is a uh, sort of you're like a virtual, you know, trying to sort of like a rainforest uh, commentary on us, you know, uh, deforest, deforestation. And it's a 4D uh, effect system. There's wind, there's uh, misters, there's a sub pack that you wear that gives you like a base resource response. And again, it's something you'd never really be able to have uh, in your home. It's really sort of unique to that space. And then Draw Me Close, which was really a profound one down on the bottom right there. Um, there's a live actor with you in the space actually acting out an avatar. And part of the way through the story, they would actually give you a hug. And um, you know, not to sound too sort of soft about it, but it was really kind of an emotional experience to be hugged by a virtual, like, but not virtual avatar in VR. So the avant-garde really loves this stuff. This is the things that they're really interested in figuring out. Um, so let's talk about the early adopter next. So who are these guys? Um, well, they're indie creators, essentially. And they're not just filmmakers, they're also game developers. Um, you could also think of agencies as early adopter companies, uh, startups trying to make a business out of uh, VR and emerging technology, and of course, research and development wings of like Facebook, Google, Samsung, companies that have revenue streams and want to figure out how to create new industry. Um, early adopters love to use web-based platforms to communicate. I don't think this is a mystery to you guys in terms of that. Um, YouTube is great for 360 video, if that's your jam, because you can now get this medium out to a really wide audience 
audience and whether they have a headset or not, they can consume it. Um, Steam, of course, has also been great for this because if you're an indie developer, it's a really friendly uh, platform for that. And then Reddit, of course, you know, for hosting the conversation, creating sub-communities. And so when I think of the early adopter, I really think about web-based platforms in terms of how they um, you know, connect with each other, share their ideas, and get feedback. Um, Early adopters are awesome hackers. Like they love to just figure stuff out and build stuff. Uh, this is a shot of Connor Hare. This is one of the first stereoscopic 180 rigs uh, to be used for shooting immersive content. And this, the material he made with this came out about two years ago. It's called Real. And Google just announced 180 uh, stereoscopic support for YouTube. So you know, again, it trickles down to the mainstream. It just takes a little while. Um, so you know, early adopters are great at hacking together new technology, figuring out workflow. They love sharing their ideas with each other, and um, you know, they are most motivated more, I think, by sort of the fame and influence and prestige than they are about getting paid, uh, you know, big paychecks. Um, I think one of the challenges with early adopters is that um, they're a little bit unrefined in some of the things that they do. Uh, they typically don't have big budgets to do high polished content, so their stuff can be a little bit rougher around the edges. And uh, they're not necessarily like highly trained in, you know, traditional media practices. Um, what they are awesome at that I found in the video side of things is figuring out the grammar of the medium. Um, who here knows who Kula Shop is? One person, okay. So Kuleshov was a Russian filmmaker um, back in like the 1920s, I think it was, when there was no grammar to filmmaking. And he created uh, the montage editing effect where he showed audiences uh, the same man in context to an image. And because of the way the images were edited together, the audience thought, oh, they saw the soup and they see the man, he must be hungry. Oh, they see the dead child and they see the man, he must be sad. Oh, they see like, you know, the woman reclining and the man, he must be in lust. Um, it's actually the same man every time and what Kuleshov discovered was the power of editing. Editing. So we're seeing the same thing now with the early adopters in 360 video. They're amazingly uh, prolific and fast to figure out what the medium is. And I think this is a really important point to sort of keep in mind for later. All right, so let's talk about the mainstream. Um, by the way, does anyone recognize who this is? Probably not. If we were in LA, maybe. This is Doug Lyman. He's the director of the Bourne series. And uh, you know, he was, I think he directed Swingers and Edge of Tomorrow. So um, I like to use the mainstream established filmmakers as the example here. Um, you know, they're basically not solely focused on VR. They create media for mass consumption. And um, you know, they work with larger budgets. So what are the biases? Um, well, you know, people who come from traditional filmmaking um, are very much biased to their, their medium. That's how they see the world. That's how they think about production and creative decision making. Um, and they already have established careers, so they're not fully committed to the medium yet. Um, they're awesome with Hollywood machinery. They're really great with you know, scripts and actors and lighting and you know, all of the, the logistics that go into making a big budget movie or TV show. And they carry cachet with funding partners, so they're really good at landing funding deals because they're a recognizable face. In fact, uh, John did a piece with Doug Lyman um, called Invisible, and Samsung and Condé Nast were able to just shower us with money because Doug Lyman's a big name. Um, there's challenges with the mainstream filmmaker. Um, there's a lot of weaknesses here. Um, for one, uh, the, the storytelling grammar of VR is totally new, and uh, people who work in traditional film don't necessarily, don't necessarily have the skill and experience to, uh, to make new, new storytelling grammar. Uh, they've never had to bail games before. They don't understand user experience or user testing or metrics. All that stuff is completely foreign. Um, VR might not be their chief focus because they've got lots of other things going on, and their time can be expensive. Um, you know, basically, the takeaway for me is that, you know, ever since Citizen Kane in the 1940s, film has kind of been set in stone in terms of its format, right? Three-act structure, camera language, sound. We get minor, you know, bumps in fidelity, and, you know, I'd say Jurassic Park maybe is where we kind of leveled off in terms of what film can do. Um, but the medium has been set, so anyone working in film inherited their entire industry. They didn't have to build it from scratch. So the other side of it, of course, is they lend credibility to the projects, and so we get showered with money when we bring them in. All right, so how to leverage these demographics to actually make awesome things. Um, so again, the way I sort of think about the relationship here is that avant-garde's out there doing crazy weird stuff, and there are lessons being learned, and the early adopters are sort of working with the avant-garde and seeing what these lessons are and figuring out how to package them up and bring them to mainstream, uh, mainstream audiences and mainstream media companies. So the guy in the middle there is a really critical piece. Early adopters are really good at translating those ideas and uh, eventually allowing them to come to mass culture. Um, when I think about how these elements might play out together, um, one of the challenges of Jaunt, of course, was how do you actually build successful 360 video content? And so I broke it down into four elements. You have storytelling, subject matter, or IP, uh, technical quality, and of course the grammar of the medium. And so really I think great 360 content is when these four elements all kind of come together. And what you'll find is that um, traditional mainstream Hollywood people are great at story and mainstream IP, 
Um, they're the ones that have you know, the big properties that already have built-in fan bases. And the early adopters and the indie guys are great at figuring out the grammar of the medium and figuring out new workflow and technology. So ultimately, I think it's really good about figuring out how to bring these people together to create new types of team structure. Um, so let's talk about generating ROI. Um, so I like to think about it as prioritizing knowledge over revenue. Um, there's a lot here, and if anyone's interested, we can give you the slide deck later. But basically, um, at this sort of point in the evolution of a new medium, I think it's really important that we focus on the knowledge first and the revenue second. And so there's different forms of knowledge that you can gain from making content projects. You can learn about artistic principles, technical uh, workflow, prestige for your brand, and then by also publishing things out in the right techniques, you can get you know audience uh, of how people are actually consuming it and using it. The previous VTime presentation was awesome for consumer insights. Um, you can learn about uh, platform insights as well, and then of course trying to generate revenue, which I believe is still very far off at this point. Um, I like to call it lean content in terms of this prototyping initiative, and there's sort of five tests that you can do. Um, you can test for uh, creative concepts, so if you have an idea, you want to figure out if it's any good. Uh, you want to test the technology it takes to bring that creative uh, technology to life. Um, relationships are a big one. You're going to be working with lots of different people in a new medium, and trying to figure out who you can collaborate with is really important. So I try in my own practice to limit the scope of what we do to as small as possible so that if we end up hating each other and can't work together, there's no, like, you know, no love lost right, for having to go our separate ways. Um, you want to test the process that you use for your creative team to actually figure out what the thing is, and then of course, if you are able to publish it in some sort of way, you can test for market fit. Um, so I guess just to wrap it all up, I think that there's roles for each of these groups. Each of these demographics have their sort of uh, their part to play. And I think the bigger challenge for us right now is figuring out how to leverage the best of everybody's background to build the most successful teams to to make this stuff make this stuff great. Because what VR needs right now is meaningful content. We're done with novelty. It's not serving our needs. And I think, frankly, um, you know, my hope, my mission is by trying to capture some of these lessons and get them out to the world that we can make stuff that matters. Thanks.